Well, thank you for allowing me to do that. Um, uh, I think it helps to have other voices sometimes. Um, I, I'd like to just piggyback on something that uh, Vodi was saying there. Uh, by the way, for those of you who didn't see, that was uh, the G3 conference this, this past uh, January. And uh, how many of you were actually here earlier, so you saw the, uh, the panel discussion? Oh, wow. Good, good number. Very good. Um, do we need to take a break so you can survive another, uh, another hour and a half? Well, you can leave whenever you want to. Don't worry about it. Get up and, get up and do what you need to do. I know it would be a long period of time for you. So you, you already know that uh, we had a panel discussion afterwards and, and fleshed out a lot of these, uh, these issues. Um, but something that happened since then to me um, was uh, back in June, I uh, put up the tweet that broke the internet um, where I made a very basic observation that just is so fundamentally opposed to the worldview of the social justice warrior that um, it, 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 it was amazing what happened for a while and continues to happen as a result of it. Uh, and that is, I was aware of the fact and had been seeing um, various uh, studies. Uh, Samuel Say, I'm not sure if you've not seen Samuel Say's stuff, let me recommend him to you. He's a, he's a young um, uh, fellow uh, up in Canada, uh, does pro-life work up there. Um, his family's from Africa. and. Uh, he, uh, I think Ghana, if I recall correctly, uh, the same as Kofi. Um, he uh, wrote an uh, article about fatherlessness and the issue in the black community. And what he did, it was very insightful, he lives in Canada, is he compared the, um, the seeking of abortion by black women in Canada with black women in the United States. And you may be aware of the fact that, that black women in the United States seek abortion about 3.5 times more often than white women in America. And uh, he pointed out that the only thing that's consistent in the Canadian experience, which does not have the American history uh, of slavery and things like that, like you have in the United States and the Jim Crow laws and all the rest of that stuff, uh, the only thing that was consistent that you could, you could trace not only between the United States and Canada, but take it over into England, which again has a completely different history and background and so on and so forth, was the issue of the family and fatherlessness. And so I put up a, a tweet because I was seeing the other side basically saying, no, 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 no. Um, uh, not only is that necessarily not a bad thing, I mean, it's just it's astonishing to me that people on the left cannot see Margaret Sanger for who she was and the placing of Planned Parenthood clinics in black neighborhoods and what she was attempting to do and her, her eugenics and everything else. I mean, it's, it's plain. It's right there on her writing. By the way, please don't post the fake pictures of her at a KKK meeting. It's a fake picture. It, it, she did address a KKK meeting, but there's no picture of it. And when we throw it out there like she's actually... It, it's not good. Um, but the, the point is, uh, basically what I said was, what is more, what do you think is more central to the fact of this, this anomaly? 3.5 times more likely. What's more central to this? What happened 160 years ago in slavery? Or the current views of sexuality and morality, including fatherlessness? within the community itself. And that's what Vody was just talking about. Because he says at one point, well, we could look at things in the community that might explain, no, no, you're not allowed to. Not allowed to, you can't look at that. It's all about oppression. Well, like I said, it broke the internet and, and people just went absolutely insane and, and I, you know, uh, I'm just the world's worst racist. My last name is White for crying out loud. I mean, how, 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 much, how much worse can it get? And, uh, but here's, but here's what you probably don't know, is that there, were, there was an individual who teaches at Cedarville College who had been using my books uh, in apologetics, and he publicly removed all of them from his classes. So if you want to know about the King James Only controversy, well, you can't read his book because he's a hate monger. So if you, if you go against 
the social justice norm. And you simply, from a Christian perspective, say, the real issue here is not to get people to look back to something 160 years ago, but to look at what's going on in the community right now. Matters of sin in the community right now. The centrality of the family, the centrality of marriage. Right now, you're a hate monger. And you will be punished. You will be punished. He says, I think everyone needs to do this and everyone needs to get rid of these hate mongers and blah, 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 blah. That's what's going to happen. That's what that, and that has happened to Vodi. And Vodi obviously has higher intersectional points than I do because he has a higher melanin count than I do. Right? But they don't care. You should, you should hear the, the words that are used of he and Samuel and, and other black Christian men who are willing to stand up and say, biblical standards first. The Bible comes first. In fact, I was listening to something from Vody this morning before I came here, and I think he actually indicated, and I did not know this, that he invented the, the phrase ethnic Gnosticism, because he did invent it, and that he invented it on my show. <laughs> that he actually thought of it while he was on my program. This was years ago when I had him on. And it was a way of referring to what we now call identity politics. The identity of the group. But the, the, the statement is, and, and this is, this is, this is what, what was illustrated uh, in that tweet from back in June, was I am not a part of the group, therefore I can't say. Only those who have our experience. So this is what's called standpoint epistemology. You have to have an experience to have knowledge of something. So if, if, you, if you apply this in any meaningful fashion in the real world, then you have to have cancer to be a cancer doctor. <laughs> Anybody, anybody going to make that a standard? Uh, if, if you get a prognosis, uh, you have cancer. Now let me ask you, you have cancer too, right? Well, no, I don't. Then how can you know? Because it's right here in the, in the report. No, but you can't know. What do you mean you can't know? Of course you can know. You can know facts. You see, this whole worldview says there is no objective revelation from God that can tell you that's sin and that isn't sin unless you're a part of the group. Doesn't, it, it is so fundamentally opposed to any kind of Christian way of thinking that when it breaks down, we sort of go, ha, 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 ha. But we can't go, ha, 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 because these people are taking over. I mean, you go to South Africa right now, and you have people in South Africa that are saying that, that studying mathematics and physics is the result of colonialization, and you should stop doing that. I don't know about you, I do not want to drive over a bridge designed by someone who thinks that mathematics and physics has been colonialized and they're not going to study it. Because physics works no matter what color you are or where you came from. And it, and it, it functions by absolutely immutable rules. So wh where can this lead but to utter destruction? Utter destruction. Now, I said uh, yesterday, I, I introduced you to, uh, that looks a whole lot smaller than it was before. It is a whole lot smaller than it was before. It is now teeny tiny. Uh, that happened to us last year, too. I'm not sure what that, what, what that is, but uh, maybe if I rejoined with it or something like that, it would make a difference. But I, uh, no, no. <laughs> I, um, I don't have this to, to dis display anyway, so you can just enjoy the small, teeny tiny little picture there. Um, I said yesterday that I needed to read for you um, some material to give you an, an understanding of some of the sources that we are dealing with with some of these subjects. Uh, but then I said this morning, I just can't bring myself to reading this on, in the morning. Well, it's late enough in the day now, we, we, have, to, we have to press through. I mentioned to you last evening uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. James Cohn, who is considered to be the father of black theology, black liberation theology, black power theology, whatever you might describe it as. He uh, passed away last year. He had been teaching at Union Theological Seminary. I mentioned at that time that Union Seminary uh, is about as far to the left as you can get to the left without going, coming around the other side. Um, 
And he's written a number of books that uh, many, again, professors in our seminaries um, not only have read, which so have I, so it's not just simply reading it that's the issue, uh, but have read and then recommend to their students as having uh, important insights uh, into, um, into the issues of the relationships of blacks and whites. Uh, in his book entitled Black Theology and Black Power, it's not entitled, it's titled, I'm sorry about that, I keep making that mistake, everybody else does too. Uh, in his book Black Theology and Black Power, I'm going to read for a few minutes. This is sort of, uh, if, if any of you are familiar with the dividing line, every once in a while I'll do story time with Uncle Jimmy. And uh, uh, normally I'm reading some Gnostic gospel or something at that point, and I'm sort of similar here, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but uh, here is a discussion toward the end of the book on the subject of reconciliation. You would think this would be an important part, right? I mean, uh, if this is a Christian man, then if his whole thing is that there needs to be reconciliation, then what's the basis of that? What's that coming from? Well, let's see what he has to say. When black theology emphasizes the necessity of a theology of revolution based on the unity of black people committed to the task of destroying white racism, it is to be expected that many white religious people will ask, what about the biblical message of reconciliation? Whites who ask the question of blacks should not be surprised if some blacks reply, yeah man, what about it? The question, while it may be legitimate, bears a close resemblance to the old or new questions about integration and love. White people, creating the barriers of separation, now want to know whether black people are willing to let bygones be bygones. White people have short memories. Otherwise, how are black people to interpret questions about reconciliation, love, and other white values? Is it human to expect black people to pretend that their parents were not chattels in society? Do they really expect black people to believe that their status today is unrelated to the slavery of the past? Do they expect black people to believe that this society is not basically racist from top to bottom? And now white religious people want to know what can be done about the wall of hostility between blacks and whites. Some critics of black theology are certainly going to suggest that my approach to theology will do more toward the separation of black and white Americans than toward reconciliation. And yet there is an appropriate concluding word to be spoken about reconciliation. I just mention in passing, this is ex so very American. Um, it does not see beyond the borders of the American experience in any way. So when it gets translated and then exported into other societies, it becomes extremely damaging. It really, really does. First, let me say that reconciliation on white racist terms is impossible since it would crush the dignity of black people. Under these conditions, blacks must treasure, oh, this is the quote I was mentioning earlier today, listen to this. Under these conditions, blacks must treasure their hostility bringing it fully into consciousness as an irreducible quality of their identity. If white people insist on laying the ground rules for reconciliation, which can only mean black people denying the beauty of their blackness, then black people must do everything within their power to destroy the white thing. Black people can only speak of reconciliation when the black community is permitted to do its thing. The black community has experienced the crushing white thing too long. Therefore, black theology believes that in order for reconciliation to be meaningful and productive, black people must have room to do their thing. The black community itself must lay down the rules of the game. White oppressors, notice the term oppression, are incompetent to dictate the terms of reconciliation because they are enslaved by their own racism and will inevitably seek to base the terms of their right to play God in human relationships. The history of slavery and Jim Crow and integration efforts render white people virtually incapable of knowing even how to talk to black people as persons. If this fact, it is this fact that nullifies the good intentions of concerned white religious people who insist that they are prepared to relate to black people as human beings. They simply do not know how. I just stop for a moment. So scripture can't, scripture can't address anything like this? Wow. Um, since racism is inseparable from the history of America, and since practically all white people in this country are taught from birth to treat blacks as things,
black theology must counsel black people to be suspicious of all whites who want to be friends of black people. Therefore, the real question is not whether black theology sees reconciliation as an end, but rather on whose terms we are to be reconciled. The problem of reconciliation is the oppressor's problem. Being accustomed to defining human relationships between themselves and the slaves on I-it terms, they naturally think that they have a monopoly on truth and right behavior. But when the slaves begin to say no to the God behavior of the masters, the masters are surprised. They are surprised because they thought the slaves were happy. They cannot believe that the hostilities of the slaves stem from anything that the masters themselves have done. But neither can they believe that the unrest in the slave camps is motivated from within the slave community. Therefore, in an attempt to explain the phenomenon of slave hostility, the masters devise, te devise tests which will show that most, if not all, people in the society are happy and the disorders are created by outside agitators who can easily be lumped into one category, communists. All unhappiness is a lie created and perpetua perpetuated by the ungodly communists who want to destroy the free American society. There are usually enough slaves around who have been so crushed by the forces of evil that they do in fact respond according to the intentions of the masters. So in other words, anybody who doesn't buy in is just a, a, a traitor. These slaves become the actual evidence that the slaves as a whole are satisfied with their condition. With this kind of assurance, the masters can begin to stamp out offenders against law and order, killing or caging all who refuse to cooperate with the laws against humanity. It is impossible for the oppressed black people of America to have dialogue with men who have this perspective. They can only say in word and deed, think what you like about America and its goodness toward blacks, but the black experience is different. And as long as you persist in that attitude, not only will there be no reconciliation, but soon it will be impossible even for us mutu mutually to survive. He, his original perspectives were very violent. But sometimes it dawns on the liberal oppressors that the oppressed do not wish to be slaves any longer and will stop at nothing to break the chains. Sometimes it enters their minds that progress is irrelevant. What the oppressed want is freedom. Now, when the liberal oppressors come to the recognition, they will ask, what are we to do? These people want to know whether all has been lost. They are inquiring whether reconciliation is possible in spite of slavery and the present crushing of every black attempt to be black. What can we say to this group? We must inform them as calmly and clearly as possible that black people cannot talk about the possibilities of reconciliation until full emancipation has become a reality for all black people. We cannot talk about living together as brothers, the black and white together attitude, as long as they do everything they can to destroy us. While black people may continue to work in the factories, teach in schools, even fight in wars, there is no law that blacks have to love whites. And as long as whites may pass laws against blacks, black people will affirm their dignity in spite of white racism at every opportunity. This country is and will continue to be two societies, one black and one white, as long as whites demand the right to define the basis of relationship. For white people to speak of reconciliation at the very moment that they are subduing every expression of black self-determination is the height of racist arrogance. Some of our liberal white friends will probably insist that we are not being fair. Uh, uh, then he has a long quote here. Do not, do not misunderstand me. Black theology is a... Now listen to this. Because up till now you're sitting there going, this sounds... Where is, the, where is anything even slightly Christian? Do not misunderstand me. Black theology is a theology which takes seriously God's reconciling act in Jesus Christ. In fact, the heart of the New Testament message is the gospel of reconciliation. As St. Paul says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 2 Corinthians 5.19. Among other things, this means that the wall of hostility is broken down between blacks and whites, making color irrelevant to man's essential nature. But in a white racist society, black theology believes that the biblical doctrine of reconciliation can be made a reality only when white people are prepared to address black men as black men and not as some grease-painted form of white humanity. Black theology will not respond positively to whites who insist on making blacks as white as possible by de-emphasizing their blackness and stressing the irrelevance of color while really living as racists. As long as whites live like white people through marriage, schools, neighborhood, power, etc., black people must use blackness as the sole criterion for dialogue. Otherwise, reconciliation will mean black people living according to white rules and glorifying white values, being orderly and calm while others enact laws which will destroy them. Black theology must reject outright this style of behavior and insist that black people can bring something to the relationship. They must bring a system of black values which deny that white is right and stress the beauty of being black. They must bring color to a sterile and depraved white people 
who have endeavored to label this world for white only. The task of black theology is to make the biblical message of reconciliation contemporaneous with the black situation in America. This is what happens when you place a lens over the biblical message that is extremely distorting. According to the New Testament, reconciliation is the exclusive work of God in which he becomes man in Jesus Christ in order that depraved humanity might become whole. Then you have a lengthy discussion from Karl Barth. Reconciliation means that God has changed the God-man relationship by making the cause of the cre creature the creator's cause. The incarnation means that reconciliation is no longer hoped for, but is a reality. It is a reality because God has done for man what man was powerless to do for himself. Basically, this means a restoration of diseased humanity. It means that man can now be what he is, a creature made for fellowship with God. Sounds good at that point. But that is only one side of reconciliation. To be reconciled with God involves reconciliation with the neighbor. To be pledged to God is to be pledged to other men. That is why the reconciling work of Jesus Christ involves a gathering of those who are committed to obedience in the world. The Christian community is inseparable from the work of the Holy Spirit. It is that community which, which accepts God's justification of man in Christ and is thus prepared to live as justified men. When we analyze the black-white relationship in the 20th century in the light of God's reconciling work in Jesus Christ, the message is clear. Well, what's the message going to be? For black people, it means that God has reconciled us to an acceptance of our blackness. If the death and resurrection of Christ means anything, it means that the blackness of black people is a creation of God himself. God came into the world in order that black people need not be ashamed of who they are. In Christ, we not only know who we are, but who God is. This is the heart of the biblical message. God has created man in such a way that man's humanity is inseparable from divine fellowship. Uh, then he goes on and quotes Bart again. It is an expression of man's inhumanity to rebel against God. Therefore, when black people say yes to their humanity by affirming their blackness, we must conclude that the affirmation was made possible through God's reconciling act in Jesus Christ. The task of black theology is to inform black people that because of God's act in Christ, they need not offer anyone an apology for being black. Rather, be glad of it. Shout it. It is the purpose for which we were created. This is the meaning of the gospel of reconciliation to black people. I wonder if you took the word black out and put Scythian in, that you'd start seeing what the problem is here from this morning, Colossians 3. Reconciliation not only means that black people are reconciled to themselves and thus to God, but also to other men. When the other men are white people, this means the black people will bring their new restored image of themselves into every human encounter. They will remain black in their confrontation with others and will demand that others address them as black people. They will not let whitey make, it an, it, make an it of them, but will insist with every ounce of strength that they are people. For white people, God's reconciliation in Jesus Christ means that God has made black people a beautiful people. And if they are going to be in relationship with God, I'm not making this up, they must enter by means of their black brothers who are a manifestation of God's presence on earth. The assumption that one can know God without knowing blackness is the basic heresy of the white churches. They want God without blackness, Christ without obedience, love without death. What they fail to realize is that in America, God's revelation on earth has always been black, red, or some other shocking shade, but never white. Whiteness, as revealed in the history of America, is the expression of what is wrong with man. It is a symbol of man's depravity. God cannot be white, even though white churches have portrayed him as white. When we look at what whiteness has done to the minds of men in this country, we can see clearly what the New Testament meant when it spoke of the principalities and powers. To speak of Satan and his powers becomes not just a way of speaking, but a fact of reality. When we can see a people who are being controlled by an ideology of whiteness, then we know what reconciliation must mean. The coming of Christ means a denial of what we thought we were. It means destroying the white devil in us. Reconciliation to God means that white people are prepared to deny themselves whiteness, take up the cross, blackness, and follow Christ, the black ghetto. To be sure, this is not easy, but whoever said the gospel of Christ was easy. Obedience always means going where other, we otherwise would not go, doing what we would not do, doing what, what we would not want to do. Reconciliation means that Christ has freed us for this. In a white racist society, Christian obedience can only mean becoming obedient to blackness, its glorification and exaltation. 
The problem with white society is that it wants to assume that everyone, everything is basically all right. It wants black people to assume that slavery never existed. And the present brutal brutalities inflicted on them are the workings of isolated individuals and not basically a part of the system itself. In this sense, reconciliation would mean admitting that white values are the values of God. It means black people accepting the white way of life. It assumes that black people have no values except which are given by the white masters. But according to black theology, it's the other way around. Reconciliation does not transcend color, thus making us all white. The problem of values is not that white people need to instill values in the ghetto, but white society itself needs values so that we'll no longer need a ghetto. Black values did not create the ghetto, white values did, therefore God's work of reconciliation means that we can only be justified by becoming black. Reconciliation makes us all black. Through this radical change, we become identified totally with the suffering of the black masses. It is this fact that makes all white churches anti-Christian in their essence. To be Christian is to be one of those whom God has chosen. God has chosen black people. It is to be expected that many white people ask, how can I, a white man, become black? My skin is white and there's nothing I can do. Being black in America has very little to do with skin color. To be black means that your heart, your soul, your mind, your body are where the dispossessed are. We all know that a racist structure will reject and threaten a black man in white skin as quickly as a black man in black skin. It accepts and rewards whites and black skins nearly as well as whites and white skins. Therefore, being reconciled to God does not mean that one's skin is physically black. It essentially depends on the color of your heart, soul, and mind. Some may want to argue that persons with skins physically black will have a running start on others, but there seems to be enough evidence that though one's skin is black, the heart may be lily white. The, ideal, the real questions are, where is your identity? Where is your being? Does it lie with the oppressed blacks or with the white oppressors? Let us hope that there are enough to answer this question correctly so that America will not be compelled to acknowledge a common humanity only by seeing that blood is always one color. James Cone, Black Theology. <laughs> Let me give you one other short um, quotation here. Unfortunately, is right now in a font that is absolutely impossible for someone over 30 years to read. From the God of the Oppressed. Lest you say, well, that was just one book. Here's another book. Here is from God of the Oppressed, page 222. When whites undergo the true experience of conversion, wherein they die to whiteness and are reborn anew in order to struggle against white oppression and for the liberation of the oppressed, there is a place for them in the black struggle of freedom. Here, reconciliation becomes God's gift of blackness through the oppressed of the land. But it must be made absolutely clear that it is the black community that decides both the authenticity of white conversion and also the parts these converts will play in the black struggle of freedom. The converts can have nothing to say about the validity of their conversion experience or what is best for the community or their place in it, except as permitted by the oppressed community itself. As is true of every member of the black community, accountability remains an essential ingredient of all who share in the struggle of freedom. But white converts, if, they are, if there are any to be found, must be made to realize that they are like babies who have barely learned how to walk and talk. Thus, they must be told when to speak and what to say, otherwise they will be excluded from our struggle. What is always ruled out is white converts using their experience in our community as evidence against blacks, claiming that reconciliation with whites is possible. Whites must be made to realize that they are, that they are only, whites must be made to realize that they are not only accountable, and I don't understand this, there's a historical reference, to Roy Wilkins, but also to Imamu Baraka. And if the latter says that reconciliation is out of the question, then nothing the former says can change that reality, for both are equally members of the black struggle of freedom. Unless whites can get every single black person to agree that reconciliation is realized, there is no place whatsoever for white rhetoric about the reconciling love of blacks and whites. For if whites are truly converted to our struggle, they know that reconciliation is a gift that excludes boasting. It is God's gift of blackness made possible through the presence of the divine in the social context of black existence. With the gift comes a radical change in lifestyle wherein one's value system is now defined by the oppressed engaged in the liberation struggle. Black people must be aware of the extreme dangers of speaking too lightly of reconciliation with whites. 
Just because we work with them and sometimes worship alongside them should be no reason to claim that they are truly Christians and thus a part of our struggle. Every mistake we make regarding white integrity will lead to the further entrenchment of our oppression by white people. James Cone. So once again, as I mentioned last night, when James Cone passed away last year, one of the six Southern Baptist seminaries, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, posted a number of webcasts and did a, a whole thing on uh, remembering James Cone and his, his vital uh, contributions to understanding black experience in America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet this is, I, there's so much more. It would take me the rest of the evening to, to read the rest of the material that you would be able to find in James Cone's books about how God is black, Jesus is black. Um, um, he, was, he was certainly not even slightly orthodox on matters of the Trinity and atonement and, and all these, these issues uh, along those lines, obviously. Uh, but when you hear the discussion of reconciliation, he knows the scriptures. He can quote Karl Barth. But then you have an application that is frightening in its implications. Frightening in its implications. And this is the type of material that is being presented as the... Look, they will say, we have disagreements. Great, wonderful. Are you seriously telling me that you cannot find individuals who will give us insights into the experience of, of black Christian Americans that does not partake of that kind of rhetoric? That kind of, of abject heresy? Seriously? That says a great deal in and of itself. So we hear these, these statements and we, we, we think of texts such as the teeny tiny text on the screen. <laughs> uh, there is neither... I'm, I'll tell you what I'll do here. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's try this. Oof, I'm gone. And looking for, looking for it, let me just reconnect. Because I think what happened is because I connected while we were um, displaying the uh, uh, video, I think it, it went it went goofy. Because it was working fine earlier today, but we weren't using the other thing. And now it can't find AirPlay anyways. Well, you all have your own Bibles. I'll keep looking for it here for a second. Uh, if, you, if you have your Bibles, Galatians 3.28, for there is neither Jew nor Greek. Uh, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. When we look at texts like this, as we looked at Colossians chapter 3, and then we hear the kind of divisive, divisive group politics uh, that are now uh, not only prevalent and constant. Uh, I'm going to have to try to find a, a way of attaching this somehow up here. This is going to be... This is going to be tricky because, unfortunately, someone's got the heat going real good. Uh, so uh, we need to do something about that. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. What was it set to back there, anyways? 85. I'm sorry? You're kidding. Yeah, but not by much, I don't think. Um, well, no, it is. Uh, the, the Coogee's nice and warm. There's no, there's no question about that. I'm just trying to... It's all wrapped up in the, uh, in the sleeve here. Um, oh. <laughs> it is nice and warm, and uh, it's supposed to be, you know, nice and cold when I come back here to St. Charles. It's not supposed to be 60-some-odd degrees like it was when I landed, uh, so... Oh yes, yes, I do. I do realize that that's. Uh, now he's crawling on the floor, not uh, out of obeisance or anything like that. But uh, there is a there is a nice fan there. 
Oh, you're just recycling the power. Okay, well, you could do that too. That's fine. It's on. Yeah. Here. Right there. Thank you. <laughs> How weird is that? <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, I don't see airplay coming up, so we won't worry about it for right now. We'll get that fixed for this, uh, this evening. Uh, my apologies for the interruption there, but it was just uh, it's getting a little on the, on the warm side. Um, where was I? Uh, we were looking at Galatians 3.28. How do we overcome this? How do we overcome these issues? How do you address someone who has taken into their thinking the concepts of social justice, how do you approach um, someone who has recently read books like Woke Church? Obviously, the, the first attempts that I have made have always been to assume the best of anyone with whom I was seeking to speak. Let's see, if, let's see if that's going to work for us. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to stay right here for now. Uh, I'm not sure what's making that sound, but it has something to do with the fan, and we'll just not worry about it. Um, I want to try to begin with the assumption that I'm dealing with a brother or sister, and that means that I want to go to the basis of Scripture. I want to go to Scripture as the basis of our fellowship, the basis of what we're to believe. And the question really comes, what happens when you encounter someone who, while speaking of the appropriate role of scripture, will not give it that place, will not allow it to challenge the presuppositions that they have embraced from social justice ideology, critical theory, and things like that. What, is there anything that can be done at that point in time? Obviously, what we're seeing is that one of the worst places to even make this attempt is in social media. Uh, we live in a day where, let's face it, it's a, it's a part of our, most of our realities. It is a mechanism of communication. Very often news travels much more quickly by that means than any other means. And it is a, it is a wonderful mechanism for the promulgation of truth. But it likewise, any, any methodology that can be used to spread truth, we already know, can likewise be used to spread error. And just as the church warned against the printing press when it was first, when it was first developed, because it wasn't long before, uh, well, we know Luther, for example, very clearly focused upon the utilization of printing as a mechanism of communication. Uh, and the church identified that as a tremendous evil. Um, even more so today, because you, you, to, you had to convince someone to print your stuff. There was a time when there was a standard of publication. Now anybody with a keyboard can publish their thoughts all across the world if they can get enough people to look for uh, their material and, and, and gain attention. And so it seems to me that so much of the animosity today is encouraged by the shallow nature of most interaction in social media. I'm thankful that we now have, what, 280 characters uh, in Twitter. <laughs> 140 was really ridiculous. Uh, if, was that the number? Was it 140, 280? Is that about what it is? Something along those lines. Some of you are going, what are you even talking about? What's Twitter? I have no idea. Um, 
but still that is an exceedingly brief space in which to say anything of, of great meaning. And so part of, hey, I got it back, part of the issue really would be, can we take these conversations where they need to be taken? And that is into the church, into the sitting across from one another, speaking to one another person to person. Um, that is the best way of doing things. But how do we deal with the fact that most of the decisions being made within our society now are, are being made without that kind of thing happening? How many people have made their decisions about upcoming elections based solely upon what they see in social media, uh, in, in that kind of a, of a context? Unfortunately, a large majority. And so we as believers have to find a way have to think these issues through. And this is not an easy thing to think through. And I think it is something that needs to be thought through, especially in, in, in foremost within our local bodies. Yes, within the family, but within our local bodies. But we're afraid to talk about these things. We are afraid because we don't know where everyone necessarily is. We don't want to be seen as someone who's promoting a certain kind of, of uh, uh, politicalization of the church but at the same time the foundation for dealing with these issues has to be a biblical one unless and let's be honest how many people are already convinced that the scriptures just simply are not sufficient to deal with this issue I mean in the back of our minds think about what we're looking at we're, we're looking at at ethnicities we are looking at gender issues. How many of you have heard part of the apologetic for transgenderism and homosexuality is that no one in Paul's day had ever heard of gender orientation and never heard of the things that we know today. And you gotta be careful because there are things we know today that people back then did not know. So since we auto automatically already recognize that as a reality, it is true on certain levels, there are things that we know today. I mean, we know uh, about all of the moons of Jupiter. And in fact, we know a lot about them and they're fascinating. Jupiter's moons and Saturn's moons and, and we're learning important things from these things. And so there, it's almost like we get a mindset that because we have access to that information, though I doubt there's only, there's probably two or three geeks in front of me who can name more than a few of these moons or things that we've learned from Io or Titan or things like that. Oh, I just identify, so I identify myself as a geek, didn't I? I did. Um, but. It's the access to that information that makes us think, oh, we know so much more than those who came before us. When my guess is, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I think while we may have a broader scope of general knowledge, the depth of our knowledge in the modern period is abysmal in comparison to men of the past. I think it's abysmal in comparison to men and women of the past. When, when men in the past knew something, they knew it far better than we know, what we know today. I think partly because we are distracted and partly because we have the attention span of four-year-olds. And we've been trained to have an attention span of four-year-olds. The very methodologies we use to communicate with one another exacerbates that and trains our minds to be constantly looking for something new. I didn't tell you, when I was on CNN, and I was on the Dr. Drew show before we went out. The producer came in. This was, <laughs> this had nothing to do with the subject, but it's, it's probably one of the saddest things that I came away from, from that experience. The producer comes in and he says, you know, we really want to encourage you to be very succinct in your answers because our studies have shown us that if the same person speaks for more than 15 seconds, we will start losing audience 
and they'll switch to another channel. Fifteen seconds. So ideally, every minimally fifteen seconds, you want somebody else saying something to try to regain the attention of CNN's audience. Does that change from channel to channel? I don't know. I can guarantee you one thing. Whatever channel has all of the baking, all the holiday baking shows that my wife watches constantly, obviously they don't have the same problem. <laughs> because she watches all of them and uh, is, is more and more uh, saying, I'm going to try that. Oh, no. <laughs> she just, she, she's never going to see this. She just made a... She just made a batch of cookies that she had seen on TV that had bacon in them. No. There is abs, I can guarantee you that violates the law of Moses. Somewhere. There is somewhere. I will find it in Hebrew, in an Akkadian script somewhere. Uh, that definitely is a violation of the law of Moses. Um, will not have that again. And I found one in, in, the, in the freezer and I accidentally tried eating it and it was like <laughs> Anyway, uh, how did I get there? Anyways, so it, 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 that's one of the main things I took away from my visit to Southern California is that we have a very short attention span. And because of that, I think modern men are not nearly as equipped to think through complicated issues because to come to conclusions on complicated issues needs you need to be drawing from knowledge from multiple different areas to bring those things together to a, 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 a solid conclusion. And if we only have a little bit of knowledge here and a little bit of knowledge there, how is it that people are coming to the conclusions that they're coming to? So how are we in the church supposed to deal with this? Well, you cannot force anyone. I have people come to me all the time. If, if, if I could just get you to talk to my friend, and I'm like, no, 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 no. No, you don't, you don't seem to understand. It has, it has very little to do with the specific individual. And I don't have some magical ability. Well, if I could just have you talk to my Mormon friend or my Jehovah's Witness friend or, and now my, my social justice warrior friend. No. That's not the answer. That's not the solution. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It's, it's not getting somebody else. You have the relationship, so it's your responsibility. And the question is, are we experiencing this as a church because we have fundamentally, we're paying the debts that we've racked up over the past number of years and decades. What do I mean by debts? Not only have I already admitted that I and many others, we didn't see this coming. There were people who did. But to be able to engage this whole realm of subjects, which are interrelated with one another, we need to have a theology that is grounded a theology that has substance, and most importantly, a theology that is holistic. What do I mean by a holistic theology? I mean a theology where you understand the relationship between your core beliefs, your secondary beliefs, your tertiary beliefs, the adiaphora. Now, if you've not heard that phraseology before, the adiaphora are the things where people are going to disagree. There are things that are not definitional. And when we talk about the Christian faith, there are absolutely definitional core beliefs. And then outside of that, there are extremely important beliefs where, where you're no longer defining the faith, but an error in this area is most likely over time going to result in a degradation of a core belief. And these, these concentric circles go out. And one of the problems with, for example, fundamentalism is fundamentalism has no differentiation. Everything is a core belief. There are no adiaphora. So if you, if you watch 
some of the fundamentalist preaching, uh, they will, uh, for example, uh, talk about eschatology. And since they're pre, pre-mill, pre-trib uh, individuals, uh, if they talk about a mid-trib rapturist, heretic, going to hell. Now that's way out here in the people disagree about lots of this stuff area, but it's all definitional for them. So there's, there, it's, it's all definitional to the gospel. If you're different than me, then you are not a believer. You're, you're just, you're, you're lost. So that is obviously, hopefully to most of us, uh, obviously erroneous in its, in its very essence. But for those who are, have a solid foundation, we need to recognize how all of these beliefs relate to one another because to engage with the social justice movement, transgenderism, abortion, um, uh, infanticide anymore, uh, euthanasia, with the culture of death that's coming from both, both directions. For example, I hope you see that the culture of death you see it in its religious dedication to abortion rights. I, I mean, I, I can't even begin to conceive. I mean, we just saw a jury in California decide that the journalists that exposed Planned Parenthood for selling baby parts are the ones that have to pay $800,000. While Planned Parenthood continues receiving millions and millions and millions of dollars from the federal government. For doing things that Mengele under Hitler didn't think of doing. And that's going on right under our own noses. And it's easy to look at that and go, culture of death. You look at Europe, and we think of Europe as being so squishy, liberal, and stuff like that. Have you looked at their abortion laws? In the vast majority of European countries, abortion is illegal after 12, sometimes 20 weeks. Here in the United States, hey, that baby can be coming down the birth canal, and you can suck its brains out. And that's considered a woman's right. Not even Europe has the kind of fanatical dedication to the murder of the unborn that we have in the United States. And one of the major leading Democratic candidates said last week, what did she say? She'd wear a scarf for Planned Parenthood. She'd wear a Planned Parenthood pink scarf when she is sworn in as President of the United States. That's, that's the level of dedication that's the level of ownership that Planned Parenthood has. At the upper levels and all the way down. All the, did any of you see what happened to one of our guys? A friend of mine, Elvis Kesto, a few weeks, uh, well, about two months ago. An abortion doctor is pulling out of, the, out of the parking lot. Elvis was wearing his GoPro, thankfully. And the guy produces a gun and aims it as, at Elvis as he's driving out. Plain as day. And we have video of the cops looking at the video. I don't know what that is. I, 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 you know, we just can't, we don't know, you know. And it just so happens that our church has a huge web presence. And so we put this stuff out there and gave them the police department's number. And uh, within about 12 hours, uh, the guy's arrested because everybody can see what it was. Now, how many people are out there doing the same type of work, but they don't have our presence? And so people get away with this type of stuff. We have so much video of local magistrates, police officers, working with Planned Parenthood. Uh, there's a guy in, in, uh, in Atlanta. Uh, you watch the video. This woman purposely hits him with her car, and they warn the guy rather than the woman who hit him purposely slowed down, veered in him, hit the car. They warned the guy. Um, the culture of death 
We see it in the abortion industry. We see it in the fact that today, one of the two political parties in our, in our country, you cannot even question that orthodoxy and be supported at all. You can't. It is part and parcel of the framework and the essence of that party's position. There is not anyone who questions it. can All of the leading candidates, abortion up to the point of birth, we're all for it. Yay, New York, good job. Right? Is there any question that at the other end of life we can see the exact same forces at operation with assisted suicide and this is where Europe's ahead of us they may be behind us on the abortion part but they're ahead of us on this you go to Europe you start looking at the laws that they have there when you've got teenagers and of course it's always said well you have to convince a judge yeah, and where are those judges going to school? In the very same wildly leftist schools that are producing all this silliness. You have to convince a judge. We have people committing suicide because they're depressed. Well, that happens in the United States. Well, this is being done with the state's approval as teenagers. We consider it a tragedy when a teenager takes their life. But the state's going, hey, we'll help you do it. We'll help you do it. This is the culture of death. But here's my point. We re it's easy to recognize that when you see baby parts splayed out across a, a, a table. That's obvious. But you must see that the culture of death is directly connected to the entire homosexual and transgender movement. Not only do you see this in the fact that the rainbow flag ends up defending Planned Parenthood and vice versa all the time. You see Planned Parenthood all the time, you know, defending transgenderism. And I mean, they have to be as woke as woke can be. They are virtue signaling constantly. But the connection should be obvious to Christians. The connection between these, these movements should be obvious to Christians. You can't talk about our society, but the average lifespan of the practicing male homosexual is considerably less than the lifespan of the heterosexual male who's married to a woman. By sometimes as much as 24 years, depending on which study you look at. That's the culture of death. And everyone knows, but you can't talk about it, that there is a massively increased presence of suicide amongst transgender people. They blame the society for that. But even those who receive surgery and reassignment, transitioning, what is the prevalence of suicide amongst them? Last, last, one, last study I heard was four times the number of suicides as those before transitioning because you can't transition it's an empty promise it doesn't work it doesn't change anything and when they find that out you don't think that's the culture of death because from a Christian perspective what is the culture of death I have come they might have life and they might have it more abundantly Therefore, anything that institutionalizes the rebellion against what Christ accomplishes is the culture of death. It's the culture of death. And it is all around us. It is fundamentally all around us. We have, let's face it, we have overused the phrase, it's a gospel issue. We've overused it. You need to be very careful that something really is a gospel issue. And so, like I said before, when you make your particular absolute down to the nth degree eschatological opinions uh, a gospel issue, then, then you're sort of abusing the phrase. But when it comes to these topics, when it comes to homosexuality, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to the nature of mankind as God's creature, when it comes to the existence of God's law, 
These are, in fact, gospel issues. Because if we cannot define what sins nailed Jesus to the cross, then we cannot talk about what he accomplished. And that's what the gospel is all about. And when we are getting to the point where in the church, in the church, we have leaders, seminary professors, who are promoting the idea that we, what, what the church has always believed, well, you know, the church has been wrong about many, many things. You know, the, the church once believed this, and we don't believe that anymore, and the, one, the church once believed that, and, and we don't believe it. So, so, you know, we really don't know about many of these things. We need to be open to change. That's the, that's the apologetic. And yet when we get into the text and we ask, so what did Jesus mean in Matthew chapter 19? What did Paul mean in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10? All of a sudden, we start hearing things like, well, here's what you hear. Here's what you hear in the seminary. Well, are you certain that Jesus said what's recorded in Matthew chapter 19? Are you, are you sure? You know, there's a lot of differences between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know. And, and are, you, are you certain that you know, this wasn't just a, a polemic that Matthew inserted at a later point, put those words in Jesus' mouth? And Paul, I mean, come on. Have any of you seen the debate that I did with uh, Barry Lynn back in 2001? Anybody, anybody seen that? Oh, well, thanks, Van. I appreciate that. appreciate that. It's, to it. Okay. Uh, well, seen, seen or heard, either one. Um, the, the, the quality of the recording, unfortunately, was really bad. The, 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 the church had some problems that night, so we had to do a lot of work on it. And he did try to sue us to suppress the, uh, the videotapes. Now, most, does any, how many of you even know who Barry Lynn was? Wow, look at that. How quickly the fame of man fades from the planet Earth. Because Barry Lynn was one of the best known social commentators of the 1990s. He was an ordained United Church of Christ minister, which that should tell you something immediately. If you don't know your denominations, the one thing you should know is United Church of Christ died with Union Seminary <laughs> long, long, long ago. Uh, and so it's a Walker denomination. Uh, you know, or uh, trying to eat you. Um, except unlike the Walkers, if you remember World War Z, uh, those, those guys were much more aggressive. You know, you can't outrun them. Uh, they're going to get you. And so uh, that's, that's a little bit more like the United Church of Christ. Uh, but he was the head of Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. And he was an ACLU attorney and board member. And so he was on the news constantly. This was before cable news and all that stuff, but he was on the news back then constantly. And he and I did a debate on Long Island um, on whether homosexuality is consistent with biblical Christianity. I'd highly recommend it to you. I've done that debate twice with him and with Bishop John Shelby Spong. Now, how many of you know who Spong is? Okay, more of you because he was more of the commentator of the last decade. You don't hear much about Spong anymore. Um, but in both instances, both instances, I'm debating a minister in a ultra-liberal organization on whether homosexuality is consistent with biblical Christianity. And the one thing that was consistent about both of them is neither one of them brought a Bible to the debate. And if you watch, we've, we've actually posted the clip of the cross-examination where I'm debating Barry Lynn, who is an ACLU board member attorney. I don't know, I guess I'm really naive. I used to think if you're an attorney, maybe you've been taught like about debate and cross-examination and stuff like that. Nah. There's been one attorney I've debated who was actually good at debate. And the rest of them have just stunk. And here's Barry Lynn. And when he's asking me questions, they're just... <laughs> oh. 
oh, you know, he does, it's, it's, it's like, like, really? And then I start asking him questions, and he is sweating bullets. He doesn't know what to do. I am pressing him hard. And at one point, he has to borrow my Bible to answer something about Romans chapter 1. And it was, oh, it was by the end of the night, he was so angry. He was berating the crowd, and he wouldn't shake my hand at the end. He was so, and once we said we were going to put the videos out, immediately we get a cease and desist letter from him threatening to sue us and the whole nine yards. And guess where he wanted to file suit? This is easy. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, of course. Where else are you going to do that? Uh, but thankfully... Alliance Defending Freedom, back then it was um, the earlier name, it was still ADF, but they, they represented us. We filed against him in Washington, which is where you do, where you're supposed to do things related to copyright issues. And uh, the day before our attorneys were to start interviewing his people, they agreed to settle for the sum of one dollar so that we could distribute the, uh, the video. We figured that was a pretty good deal. One buck, we'll, we'll, we'll handle that. Um, and so the, uh, the, the video is available. Um, but both of them, both of these men, didn't even bring a Bible to a debate on whether homosexuality is considered with biblical Christianity. And yet, who has had a greater impact in the society? And, has, and who does media go to? Those are the kind of people they're going to go to. Because they know they're going to represent a compromised, unbiblical Christianity. They're going to go to those folks. They're going to go to those folks. You have to see the relationship, the culture of death. It's abortion. It, it's infanticide. It's, it's uh, euthanasia. And yet it is very much a part of homosexuality, transgenderism. It's all about destroying that which Christ has come to give. Life. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. Now, what we're going to do in the evening session is I'll have a, a few more brief comments to make. Uh, but then we will have a lot of time for Q&A because we haven't had any up till now. Um, I, that's not been purposeful on my part. It's not that I'm you know, afraid to answer questions about something like this. It's just that uh, that's just sort of how it's worked out with the scheduling and, and things along those lines. Um, but in the last 10 minutes or so, uh, if you have some questions about what you heard, especially in the um, panel discussion, uh, I think I could probably address most of what Vodi had to say. Um, maybe we can sort of get an early start uh, with just a, a few questions just to, just to get them off of, especially if some of you are not able to, let's put it this way, especially if you're not able to come back this evening and you want to get a question in, because we're going to have time this evening, so especially if you're not going to be able to come back this evening, now will be the time. Yes, sir? Uh, yeah, after the uh, uh, states, the states uh, Right. Uh, the, uh, the New York Times doesn't tell her anything about the and blacks. As far as I can tell, since this was passed, it affected this thing, it would have affected uh, blacks and it was black women. Mm -hmm. So they sent it to a reporter in Missouri to talk to uh, <coughs> black pastors in St. Louis, a uh, black woman from the back here. And what they did is they, uh, they tasked the, uh, they, they explained the need for, uh, first of all, the pastor said, uh, I'm not comfortable with these white mother slaves uh, passing this restricted divorce law. Right. And while I was talking to you all before, how, how does the law get back to the law in the comparison to the pastor? But what they're saying is that because these white Right. 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 
Well, there's, 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 there's no question that there is great frustration on the part of many of my uh, black brothers and sisters uh, with the leadership within what is generally called the black church on this subject because clearly there has been a major shift uh, over the decades um, and the relationship between uh, leftist politics and, and left and the black leadership, not necessarily the people in the churches, black leadership, is well known. Um, uh, Jesse Jackson was once against abortion, and then, of course, that had to change. I haven't heard anything about him from a long, long time now. Um, he seems to have faded from, faded from view. But we're talking politics here. And um, that's, that's, the, that's the problem, is if, if your first and foremost um, priority is political, um, then there are only certain realities that you can, you can pursue if you're going to be acceptable within the left. And as of the past number of years, support for Planned Parenthood and unlimited abortion rights um, is the, the price you have to pay. And there are obviously many, many, many uh, good brothers and sisters in black churches that recognize the tremendous um, holocaust that has taken place uh, amongst uh, the black community. And they re they've read Margaret Sanger. They know where the motivation is. They know what the issues are. Um, but you, you use the term and, and illustrate it, New York Times. What do you expect? Um, uh, we do not live in a day where we have much left in the way of journalism. Uh, we have advocacy media outlets. Um, and we are now left having to balance the advocacy group of one side versus the advocacy group of another side to try to figure out what the actual truth is. And so you pick and choose who you're going to interview. Um, the very idea that protecting the lives of unborn children could in some way be racist should give us an indication of how effective the brainwashing of the educational system and of the left in our society has been. Um, it is interesting, though, that there is a, a counter movement. It's been observed that starting in the 1980s, and I remember when my son was born, we had one of those first, remember, the, well, some of you don't, uh, these first early grainy ultrasounds of this little thing, you know, and you could barely make out what it was. But those have become better and better and better. And we now live in a day where most of the young people have seen either themselves or their siblings hanging on the refrigerator before being born. And there's just simply the reality that you recognize that's not a clump of cells. That's a human being. And I was once that. That's where I was. And I was unique then. I didn't become unique the moment that I was born. And so there is, there is a pushback the other direction. But that is, is in direct contrast with the culture of death and and you just just have to realize the abortion is the center sacrament of the culture of death and that's why you see it taking the position that it's taking within our own society have you ever seen anything else that would be defended with the vitriol with the absolute commitment that you see to abortion uh, on, the part of, uh, on the part of people in the United States today. It's stunning. It is absolutely stunning. Yes, sir? You say that vitriol, you encounter LGBT, they're trying to say it's genetic, it's uh, a, couple, a couple of months ago, you know, some study they did, and they tried to say that there are different markers, not a genetic gene this time. And the vitriol on their side is just as like even someone that lived years homosexual and they, they say stuff and change and stuff oh, yeah. and share their story. It's like, well, they really weren't saying. More, more gay, right, yeah. Oh, there's no question about that. Now, now the, the LGBTQ community, whatever that means, has 
is of two minds about the genetic stuff. Because on the one hand, if, you, if, you, if they say that it's genetic, and we now have what's called CRISPR technology, what if you could find the gay gene and fix it? Well, they don't want that. So they're of two minds. So there are some who would like to say, oh no, I was just born this way. But then on the other hand, if you could fix it, then you'd try to be getting rid of us. So it's not genetic. And so there is a, there is a, uh, there's a problem at that point. Um, and they, they struggle as to exactly how to handle that particular issue. Um, from the Christian perspective, let, let's say they find a, something that, that causes a propensity. Let's say it's, for example, one of the, one of the better theories has been that uh, exposure, overexposure to certain hormones at certain points in the pregnancy might result in, in a rewiring of certain parts of the brain so that there's a confusion or a less of, of a normal uh, desire for female on the part of a male or something along those lines. Let's say that that was found to be true. From a Christian perspective, would that mean homosexuality is good? Because we already know that you can find genetic markers for obesity, for uh, anger, for all sorts of things like that. Do we therefore give a moral pass or what does that mean? That means that you have a challenge in your life given how God has formed you. That's all it means. God's law doesn't change because of that. And uh, so we have to think these issues through. We have to, we have to see where they're, where they're coming from and see, and be very, very careful. I, I am highly skeptical of anything anymore that I read in most anything in the New York Times or anything else, or Fox News for that matter. Give anything time. There was a day in our culture where the newest news may have been interesting, but it wasn't assumed to be true until time had passed and it could be thoroughly vetted and, and examined. We need to readopt that standard. We react so quickly. And I've, I've, I have to, you know, I, I have to talk about current events. But the reality is that especially when it comes to research issues and things like that, don't jump on the most recent thing and say, there it is. I mean, it's not, it's not related, but remember the faux pas we had of first century Mark uh, a couple of years ago when, when it was announced we had found a fragment of the Gospel of Mark from the first century and it turned out to be the third century. I was one of the first people when I came out saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, t time out, this hasn't been examined yet, hasn't been published yet, no one's, no one's looked at it. Wait, we, we, and, but there were people going, see, we've, we've been vindicated in Mark's early. It's like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. And then when it comes out, it's from the third century. Um, that's in biblical studies, but the same thing is true in everything else. Patience, patience, give it time. How many things that came out two years ago are we still all up in arms about today? Most of us have forgotten what the big news was two years ago. We really have. Um, who's Brett Kavanaugh anyways, right? I mean, seriously. Because when that happened, I remember, I remember hearing a, a news commentator saying, this is just so incredible. This is going to impact the 2020 election. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You are really giving people a lot of credit to think that that many years down the road, two, that anyone's even going to remember it. Well, there are a few of us that was sat there going, wow. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, can I give you my personal opinion, not as a theolo just a personal American citizen. Right now, here's my conclusion. If there are any future Republican presidents, and that gives you an idea of how trusting I am of the electoral system right now, and when they get rid of the electoral college, which they're, which they're doing, um, that'll be the end of that. You'll have one party rule. That's worked well in California, hasn't it? Oh yeah, it's worked very, very well. But if there are any future Republican presidents, every single one will be impeached in his first year. It doesn't matter what he does. It doesn't matter what he does. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. Because they were talking about that the, the day the man was elected. That's just the way it's going to be. 
So I, I remind you, John Adams, the Constitution is sufficient only for a religious and moral people. It is wholly insufficient for the governance of any other. So um, are any of you not going to be here this evening? Oh, all of you. Well, we. <laughs> Well, why didn't you put your hands up before? Because we are now completely out of time. Um, so uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, but I was hoping that so we could get those questions in because uh, we're going to spend a lot of time uh, on Q and A uh, once we get back from uh, once we get back from dinner. So uh, you have a solution? Okay, real quickly, and then we'll wrap up. He who offers a solution gets to ask the question. So. I'm sorry. Can you just tell us what direction you're going to try to go? Because we work in this culture, we do things, and you have 15 seconds. Yeah, I have 15 seconds. No. Look, this is not the first time that Christians have faced a society in turmoil and decay. Um, there was a guy named Augustine, you may have heard of before, who wrote a book called The City of God. And he was living in the death throes of the Roman Empire. And man, for a lot of Christians, Rome had defined stability in the world for centuries, a lot longer than we've existed. And so a lot of people were really, what's gonna happen? How am I gonna, how am I gonna? And his message is the same message we have. Yeah, I, I am concerned about what kind of a world my grandkids are going to face. And I am concerned about the use of technology. And I'm concerned about 1984. And I'm concerned about what China is doing to both Christians and Muslims. And, and I am concerned about all these things. But in the midst of all these things, Psalm 2 is still true. He who sits in the heavens laughs. He's not been caught by surprise by any of this. Jesus is still King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if he chooses to bring this world through a period of purging that will demonstrate the truth of the gospel to the nth degree, because you see, the farther we go into rebellion and decay, the more gloriously his truth shines. So I hear you. I get it. But we are called to be faithful in whatever situation he calls us in and to never lose sight of the fact that the light that comes out of that empty tomb cannot be extinguished. As dark as it may be in our day, that light will never be extinguished. We will always have access to it. That is the great hope of believers. Thank you for that question. Thank you for that question. All right, so uh, still got plenty of time for, uh, for dinner, just not as much time as normal. Uh, and uh, then we will be back. And those questions, um, if you're not going to be here this evening, maybe you can find someone who will be and write it down for them. And it's going to be recorded and posted. So if, if you can't be here tonight and you've still got a question, write it down. And either maybe uh, maybe Van, if they just gave it to you, or you could give it to somebody or something like that, or S Steve or somebody back there. Um, yes, yeah, put it put it back there in the sound booth, and we'll we'll try to get it asked. And then uh, when the videos are put up, then you'll you'll get your answer anyways. Okay. So thank you for being here. We'll see you this evening.